Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this final session of the World Economic Forum's Job Reset Summit 2020 being live streamed on the forum website as we speak. Welcome to all of you watching us there too. My name is Ana Maria Montero and I will be your guide for the next 30 minutes or so of what is the final session of the Equity, Inclusion and Social Justice Program of the Summit, also today's theme. Now in today's sessions, we focused on how we can reset equity, inclusion and social justice in a new economy and society. And we highlighted new insights, surfaced new standards and examples of best practice and potential new solutions and approaches. And as we close the day, we're going to look now at defined outcomes. What key ideas, concepts, and actions for equity, inclusion, and social justice emerged from the final days of the Jobs Reset Summit? Our goal is to provide synthesis on the state of the issue and raise awareness of the most pressing issues and priorities required to shape the Jobs Reset agenda. Now, of course, I'm not going to do this by myself. I am being joined in this reflection by a panel of very esteemed women who are joining me from all over the world, and three of which are actually co-chairs of the Jobs Reset Summit, in particular of the diversity, equity, and inclusion topics on today's agenda. So I'd just like to briefly introduce them to you. We'd like to start with Joanne Jenkins. She is Chief Executive Officer of AARP, calling in from the U.S., we have also Afsane Mashayeki Beshlos. She is executive officer of Rock Creek, also in the US, welcome. Caroline Casey, founder and director of Val Valuable 500, calling us from Ireland. And finally, Minister Monica Salaket. She is women and gender equity minister of Chile. Welcome ladies, such a pleasure to have you here with us this evening. I can't wait to hear your insights. I know a couple of you have already been in sessions today. Um, so I'm, I'm excited to hear, uh, hear some of those outcomes. So Joanne, if you don't mind, uh, we'd like to start with you. Tell me, what have you seen in relation to the solutions being promoted by businesses to deliver social and racial justice in the workplace? Um, looks like... Okay, well, we're gonna we're gonna come back to Joanne. I'm gonna move on to Afsane, who is already on screen, <laughs> on my screen anyway. Afsane, tell me, um, how are businesses mobilizing and planning to take action in the future in order to ensure that equity, inclusion, diversity, social justice remain a priority on the path to recovery? Um, Afsane, yes, there you go. You were muted. Wonderful to be part of this panel, Anna Maria, and uh, really excited to uh, to be on today's uh, session as uh, as we talk about the whole job reset topic. And really, congratulations to the World Economic Forum for all the work that um, the forum has done on this topic at this time, because so much uh, talk had gone on in the world uh, between the public sector and the private sector on the topic pre-COVID. But I think taking uh, this particular last seven, eight months and doing this study in such a short time, I thought was really, really exemplary. And what it shows really, uh, Anna Maria, is really the importance between the um, public sector and the private sector working super closely on, on this issue. Because we see a tale of two cities, right? Mm. There is people who are actually not benefiting from COVID, but being able to function fully, if not more productively because of technology. And then we have very large parts of the population in the US, in Europe, in emerging markets, in high income, middle income and low income countries that are getting left behind more and more and more as they don't have access to broadband, as they don't have access to the education, they don't have access to all the training that you need that we talk about in this report and has been talked about the last few days. So the really important thing is how do you take advantage of all this technology of all the training programs that are there to really help this group that has been marginalized in my day job we have invested over 6.2 billion in firms that are diverse women um, and other forms of diversity 
And I know from a real point of view in the private sector, it's possible to do a lot more. The very large companies, I think, taking these reports really to heart will be able to hugely increase um, the proportion of training they're giving and the help they can uh, provide to inclusion of a much larger part of the population in the group that's getting paid enough to have a good life and to be able to thrive. All right, thank you so much, Afsane, for your thoughts tonight. I see that Joanne has, uh, has joined us now. <laughs> Joanne, I'd like to circle back to you, welcome. Thank you, apologies well for the technology on my side. <laughs> Well, it's part of our it's part of our new normal, right? The technology mm -hmm. and the challenges that sometimes come with it. So I so again, and uh, Joanne, um, what have you seen in relation to? I'm just going to jump right in. So, <laughs> what have you seen in relation to the solutions being promoted by businesses to deliver social and racial justice in the workplace? Well, I think what we're seeing is a new uh, level of commitment, particularly by CEOs of, of really wanting to engage and wanting to be involved in bringing about solutions. I think the key will be to hold them accountable and for us to all work together. I don't think uh, that we can accomplish much if it's not everyone jumping in. So it's not only the private sector, uh, and CEOs around the world, but it also is governments and, and addressing systemic uh, public policy kind of issues that we need to make sure is in place. And then uh, certainly we all need to uh, personally be responsible for those courageous conversations that need to be had, uh, not only within ourselves and our family, but in where we're working. And so I, you know, I'm, I'm energized by the uh, different levels of engagement, regardless of age uh, and diversity and, and all of the other factors that we're looking at. Uh, but I think we have to keep the momentum going and we have to hold each other accountable. Good advice. All right, uh, so moving on to Caroline now, who, as I said, is calling in from Ireland. How have businesses, Caroline, uh, demonstrated driving a new agenda for disability inclusion? Well, thank you. I just want to say it was an absolute honor to be a co-chair and I really want to thank the World Economic Forum for making the space for the panel that we had today on the new business agenda mm -hmm. for uh, disability inclusion. And this is the point. Um, we have three extraordinary statistics that help frame this. Uh, disability exclusion costs OECD countries 7%. 90% of children who have a disability don't get into a classroom and you're 50% more likely to experience poverty. There are 1.3 billion in people in the world who have a lived experience of disability and it has been quite an overlooked issue. Mm -hmm. How business are finally rectifying this is through business leadership. Business is the most powerful force on the planet and when it sees the value of this community, the Valuable 500 was launched at the World Economic Forum 19 months ago. We were told we were crazy. Um, it was absolutely insane to consider that we could get 500 of the world's most influential brands and leaders to elevate disability inclusion to leadership level. Today, we're at 335 organizations representing 12 million people, employees globally. Mm -hmm. And that is 31 countries, 52 sectors. To answer your question, I think what's happening now is that disability is a, a metaphor for how we're starting to increase and enlarge the inclusion agenda. We are starting to see that the business world is seeing the corrosive nature to the siloed approach of segregating our inclusion agenda where we're pitting society against each other. With the increase of the organizations joining the Valuable 500 and with leadership taking the accountability of board level, we are starting to see the systemic change that we need. Full human inclusion. We are not one dimensional characters and therefore we need to be fully represented in business. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Caroline, for your insights. And um, now I'd, I'd like to reach out to Minister Salaket, uh, calling us from Chile, of course. If we take stock, Minister, of the multi-stakeholder collaborations aimed at closing the gender gap and mainstreaming 
the DNI agendas, what would you say has been achieved? How successful have they been? Yeah. Thank you, Ana Maria, and to all the wonderful speakers joining us today. And I'm grateful for this opportunity provided by the World Economic Forum. I would like to start by saying that gender inequality is not only a pressing moral and social issue, but a critical economic challenge, particularly after this global crisis where millions of women have been forced to leave the workforce. Chile has been working strongly on partnering with the private sector as a key ally to advance gender equality. The Gender Parity Task Force, or IPD for its initial in Spanish, is, is an initiative which, have, we, which we have been promoting and working on since 2016. During this time, we have focused on three major objectives increasing the participation and retention of women in the labor market, raising awareness about the gender weight gap and implement concrete actions to reduce it and promoting and increasing the participation of women in high level and leadership positions. Today, IPD Chile has 180 member companies working on generating important organizational changes to close their internal gender gaps. This is the largest public-private sector task for the gender equality in the world. These last three years, IPD has helped us achieve important goals. The initiative's broad scope has allowed us to advance toward important legislative policy and private sector changes, which include the universal daycare reform bill, the creation of a registry of women or boards of directors, the amendment of regulation related to gender diversity in Chilean boards, and the expansion of our four to seven program, which allows girls and boys between the age of six and 13 to remain in an educational establishment after school. We also launched along with the private sector, the first gender equality report that shined a light of companies, gender gaps and progress. As the Ministry of Women and Gender Equality, we strongly believe that addressing gender gaps on a global level is the only way we can achieve sustainable growth. This is a challenge that requires a holistic approach in that regard, we are moving forward with IPD 2.0, which will enable us to pursue greater goals by working closely with all stakeholders. Three new strategic objectives have been incorporated in response to the social demands that we will make evident during the October 2019 social crisis and the challenge brought forth by the COVID-19 pandemic. First, developing actions that accelerate cultural transformation. Second, encouraging the adoption of corporate practice that promote gender equality and parental co-responsibility. And third, promoting the incorporation of new workplace policies that allow us to collaborate in the prevention, detection, and reporting of violence against women. The cultural transformation we are looking for can be accelerated if we give greater visibility to the initiative in Chile and we enhance our relationship and feedback with companies. We must also strengthen our in-person and online learning communities and focus intensely on labor, reinsertion and economic reactivation throughout the pandemic's duration. Finally, we must take into consideration that the increase in automated jobs will be yet another challenge for women in the workplace. The amount of time spent on unpaid care and domestic work will greatly affect how women learn new skills to participate in a highly digitized economy. 
all the while facing important financial contracts. Women have less access to digital technology and have lower participation in STEM fields than men. If we can help women transition into the digital economy successfully, it will mean that they have access to more productive and better paid work. If we don't, wage gap will continue to grow and women will be forced out of the labor market. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for that. I, I, I also would like to add that um, Jordan is also going to be joining the Closing the Gender Gap Accelerators. So okay. it's the next, yes, it's the next uh, country to join you in your efforts. And the second one in Middle East and Africa after Egypt. <laughs> so power in numbers, power in numbers. Um, Minister, if I could ask uh, you one more question. Where do you think public funding and investment should be directed now in order to improve the position of women in the labor force? Uh, the first step, should be for government to target women as the main beneficiaries of subsidies and emergency support, uh, not only because they are most severely affected by decisions to reduce costs both at the company and household level, but because we know that when we invest in women, that translates into more responsible spending. With this in mind, all our government support package and job protection program have targeted and largely benefit women. For example, 58% of the households that have received our COVID-19 subsidy are led by women. And we have launched multiple employment subsidies focused on creating 1 million new jobs for women and young workers. However, Transferring resources and benefit is not enough. It is key that reactivation and recovery strategies are as a whole included a gender perspective. This is crucial considering that traditional economic recovery efforts tend to focus on infrastructure spending to initiative job creation in the construction and mining industry. These are male dominated industries, so women barely benefit from this massive investment. This is why it is essential to engage with this sector and make sure that an important part of those new jobs target women. Our ministry has established working groups with both the construction and mining sector to train women to be competitive in these markets and ensure they are a central part of their recovery effort. The pandemic has also accelerated the digital transformation, showing us that tech will continue to play a central role in our lives and increasingly drive our economy. We must ensure our no are not left behind investing in programs that develop digital skills for women as key driver of economic recovery. Lastly, I would like to stress that all this effort will be in vain if we don't invest in addressing the main obstacle for women to participate and remain in the workforce, the burden of care and domestic responsibilities. It is urgent that government invest and strengthen integral care systems that allow for women and men, as well as for the state, communities and households, to share care responsibilities, allowing women to enter or re-enter to the labor market. All right, thank you so much. And um, on that note, so we've heard uh, from the minister about what the governments can do. I'd like to hear from the rest of our panel about where, I mean, this is a panel, this, we're looking at outcomes, right? We're looking at, 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 at th things that we can actually do. Um, what, in your opinion, should businesses, how should they deploy their efforts? What should they do? Caroline. <laughs> Listen, I'm going to be bold. I've got the bold wallpaper. Three things. <laughs> yes, you do. Now, three things. We need to make sure that our communication, even more so now, is fully inclusive. 
We can no longer talk about that and put it to the side. We need, if we have the right to speak, we need the right to receive. The second is human-centered design. This is where business actually can make a move looking at how it benefits serving more people, which is about growth and innovation. Thirdly is about representation, full inclusive representation. How do you know your consumers if you cannot see yourself in the communication? But lastly and above all, and this is the bold statement, do we not believe at this point we should be looking at a completely universally corporate human culture? Do we not believe instead of having all of our initiatives like the Valuable 500, that we should be working inclusively together for a, a collective good while still balancing our unique, beautiful and magnificent identities. It is beneficial for the business and it is more cost effective for the business, but the cost to society to silo us against each other in different initiatives and agendas, I think is detrimental. And this is something business can do and is beginning to do and we should help and support and scale it. Wonderful, thanks for that. Um, Afsane, can I? Oh, Joanne put her put her hand up. That's okay. Oh. That's okay. I'll, <laughs> um, I'll go. Um, I, I actually was going to mention Joanne because I'm very fortunate in my day job at Rock Creek. We work very closely with Joanne's team, and I think uh, some of the areas we work together on, and um, we do it in general in Rock Creek, is really the allocation of capital, because the way to ensure inclusion private sector and public sector, as the minister said, it is the allocation of capital. The way the companies can, um, can, can do a better job is by allocation of capital. The way investors can do a better job is the allocation of capital. It's a very powerful force. And I think for, um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we have been able to allocate close to 6.2 billion in our firm to inclusion. And I think given that, I would really um, encourage the private sector, in particular, the large corporations to take it more seriously and to find ways of doing it with creating the new networks, as we heard from the other speakers. And I will pass it on to Joanne because I think she has a lot of leadership in this area. Well, I was just gonna add that I think that we can't look at this as some kind of initiative, that it actually has to be the business strategy, that uh, businesses need to understand that this also affects their bottom line, which is how we get them to move and change the market. And I think that uh, I know for us at AERP, uh, the inclusion, addressing the uh, societal injustices and looking at health disparities, uh, and financial disparities is our business strategy. We don't see a path forward for A or P in the next 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, unless we are more inclusive uh, and that we are looking at uh, inequities, not only in, inside of A or P, but in the partners of who we do business. And so we have now built that into our next three year strategy, holding ourselves accountable as also holding the people that we do business with accountable uh, so that we're not going to do business with companies who are not uh, valuing uh, persons with disabilities or women or minorities or that don't provide adequate health services uh, uh, to their um, employees or the people that they're serving. And I think once we all collectively agree that that is the new standard by which we're going to do business, then I think we'll begin to start to see movement. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And uh, on that uh, amazing, uh, those last amazing thoughts, I want to thank you all for joining us today on this panel for your reflections. I'll be brief, but very powerful. Thank you so much. I'd like to hand it over now to Sarita Nayar. She is Managing Director and Chief Operating Officer of the World Economic Forum to share some next steps and reflect on the outcomes of the day. Sarita, the floor is yours. Uh, good afternoon and good evening, everyone, depending on which part of the world you're joining from. Um, first, I would like to thank you, Anna Maria, in shepherding today's conversation. Thank you to Minister Zalakat for driving such a, an impactful initiative on gender equality in Chile that, of course, we are very proud to be associated with. And thank you very much to Caroline, Afsania, and Joanne 
for co-chairing the Job Reset Summit. Uh, I think the energy and the passion that you all bring to this issue is very commendable. We, of course, greatly value your leadership at this very critical time and in ensuring that we embed equity, inclusion, and social justice as we build a new economy. This is spoken about. And we need to make sure that it works for all of us, not just for the few. And you have all articulated that really well. We have heard uh, during the course of today a rich array of priorities and actions coming out of the various discussions. Um, anything from needing a new definition even for diversity, equity, and inclusion through very practical initiatives and actions. And uh, from a forum perspective, I would like to just very quickly recap perhaps three quick uh, outcomes. One around new insights. Um, so the future of jobs report, which actually has provided the foundation for much of the summit's discussions as well, has shown us that the dual impact of technology and the recession on jobs has been worse for women, for youth, for lower income workers, We've also seen during this COVID time uh, that similar negative impact and double disruption is happening for racial and ethnic communities and minorities. This was discussed in this panel as well. I think we can look at all of this as a warning to us to ensure that we do use this moment to embed equity in the new economy that we all wish to create. The second area is around new standards, and you mentioned that at the start of the session as well, and Maria, the resetting the future of work principles that we have proposed, basically propose that companies must consider a new benchmark for diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, especially when it comes to ushering in a new era of work in the organization. We don't think companies can hope to uphold the principles of stakeholder capitalism or the demands of our societies today um, without it. And in that regard, we have the DEI 4.0 toolkit that has uh, been created in partnership with all our partners. And that helps to uh, have companies deploy technologies that can support inclusion. And on the third front is really new actions. What new actions can we take? And in this regard, we have made some very good progress through the forum platform and we've showcased some of this during the summit to highlight um, just very few. Uh, first, of course, uh, Caroline's leadership has been absolutely critical in committing the more than 330 companies, I guess it's 335 now, as Caroline just shared, um, and uh, creating this valuable 500 uh, initiative for the disability inclusion. In fact, I think since the time we had Davos and met in January, we've launched or added additional 95, so coming up to additional almost 100. Second, we have a partnership for global LGBTI equality that has also continued to make significant progress and strides in having cross-company learning and ensuring that this agenda stays uh, on the forefront, um, also highlighted by many of the panelists here. Uh, we had the minister talk and on our front as well on the forum platform, the public and private sector led initiatives on gender equality have expanded their work. They have refined the focus. Anna Maria mentioned as well, the forum is also very proud that Jordan has become the second country from MENA to join this cohort um, in launching closing the gender gap accelerator. Um, and I think we now have a total of 10 in this network, including Argentina, Chile, Colombia, Panama, Costa Rica, Peru, uh, Dominican Republic, Egypt, and also France. And finally, together with our chief diversity and inclusion officers community and other partners of the forum, we will actually be launching a new coalition on partnership for racial justice in business um, in the coming weeks. So very aligned with what you, uh, the panel has been challenging for the business to deliver. We do hope that uh, much more uh, will, we will be able to work on much more with all of you, with all our partners, and we welcome all ideas that everybody has. I would like to thank everyone um, again, the panelists, and I also hope that all the people who have joined online for the summit and the session, that you will now join us for the closing plenary of the entire Jobs Reset Summit. This uh, closing plenary will actually pull together the four themes that we have uh, deliberated on over the last four days. And it is chaired, chaired by our founder and executive chairman, Klaus Schwab, and it is starting now. Thank you. <laughs>